Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on the show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. Dean McGuire is an Australian fine art photographer who has an obsession with black and white imagery. Dean purchased his first camera back in 2008 and after trial and error found himself falling into love with all things landscape photography. Since that time he's been forever perfecting the craft as there is always so much to learn. Join us for an insightful journey into Dean's world of black and white fine art imagery. He shares his evolution from family inspired beginnings to finding solace and expression through photography. We delve into his transition to a fine art style, ethical manipulation techniques and pivotal moments shaping his aesthetic. We explore his projects, workflow and strategies for overcoming creative blocks. Dean emphasises the significance of passion, persistence and authenticity in artistic vision, along with lots more. Hey Dean, welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? I'm good, mate. How are you today? Yeah, very good. Very good. Pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, been a, a fan of your podcast and also mm-hmm. a fan of your work for a little while. Let's okay. start not with the podcast. We'll start yep. with the photography. Where did the, where did photography kick off for you and how did you get into it? It's a real hard one for me with in regards to where it started because I think it's always been there in my past as photography because I found out in a later date when I was uh, a bit older, I think my dad used to do a bit of photography and so yep. did his father with the old box brownie and my dad had a little little Pentax film camera. Sure. But he gave it up when I was born. So that was uh, 35 years ago, wow. <laughs> poor fella. <laughs> so I think it was always lingering there, but without me really noticing. Yeah, you're right. Um, I think I first picked up a little camera. I, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, like we're middle income earners. My parents were. So I, uh, they had just little those little Kodak point shoots sort of yeah. thing back in the day they just go to Kmart and develop your film yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they had one of those and I think I just picked up one of those when I was a kid and fell in love with it and and I think went from there I picked up, I actually bought my first camera when I was about 18 years old right okay uh, my parents wanted to get me one when I was a bit younger but I, I was real stubborn and I said no I want to do this and pay for it myself and make yeah. my way awesome. when I was 18 I was able to be able to pick up a my, my credit card and well not my credit card my bank card and go and buy one so i bought Excellent. a yeah my first camera was a uh, fujifilm s5 pro so it was an aps-c camera yep. and uh, it was i'm pretty sure it was modeled off the old nikon d200 because it had a yeah. nikon mount, f mount on it oh, <laughs> so, okay cool yeah so it was quite handy like i could i had this real nice colors coming out of the the fuji system with nikon glass so it yeah was, very cool. good. So yeah, it started realistically started for me when I was about 18 years old. Yeah. Okay. So, and yeah. so what does it mean to you now? What is photography in your life? For me now? Yeah, it's a good question. I'd say it's an escape. When I got my license, I was, I used to surf a lot too. So mm-hmm. I used to go out to the beach and that was my escape was the surfing. And then surfing used to, I used to go out for two, three, four hours at a time. So time as you grow up, you, you get a job and that becomes a priority. So I needed that outlet. So when I was 18, I, I picked up the camera and then it started becoming my escape instead of the surfing. So it quickly replaced. So it's my time, my escape from reality. Mm-hmm. I can go out, I can shoot, create, and there's no external thoughts at that period of time. So yeah, it's nice. just a, it's a reality check really. And what motivates you creatively? Is it the creation of art? Is it the documentation of what you're seeing out in the world? What- what kind of grabs your attention and makes you do what you do? It's a real hard one, really, because I can't really say mine's documentation. It's quite fine art, really. Um, yeah. I do, I, full disclosure, I do manipulate my photos pretty rapidly. The subject stays the same, so I don't really touch the subject as such. Yeah. It's more the background to bring the subject out. But for me, when I first started, I, I wanted to be everything natural. I wanted to go down that real Ken Duncan route, who was, Obviously, he's still an icon yep. and, a me- and without knowing it, he's a mentor to a lot of photographers of our generation. So I really wanted to go down that natural route and really yep. showcase what the Australian landscape was. But now uh, what motivates me is really bringing out the subject detail of yeah, what's right. sitting in front of me and also creating a, a product or an image that is different to what everyone else has seen. Like 
mm. for instance, we've all gone down and well, not all of us, but a lot of us have gone down to Bermagui and taken a photograph of Camel Head, Camel Rock, Horse Head yep. Rock. I yep. think you've been there recently. I, I, yeah, think I, I was down there well. a couple of weeks yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those locations that it doesn't matter how many times you shoot it. It's fantastic. Absolutely. You have, yeah. have so much fun down there. And I, I could um, happily go down there for yeah. months on end yeah. if, if I could. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So take that sort of for instance, it's how, what my drives me is how can I get this image, like this location and subject in a different light? And that's what I, and that's what I try to strive for is it's not to be different for different sake. It's just to be different for a creative sake. And, right. and, and the way I approach my work is, will I print this on and put this on my wall? And that's how I determine on what I create and what I capture. Yeah. So yeah, it's, right. yeah. So kind of a obscure answer, but yeah. So mine is all is art driven based more than capturing and documenting. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And in that, where did you mentioned you started mm. trying to stay with that natural path and at some point you you changed what was that point and what was the trigger for that it was a black and white photograph i took of um at narrabeen at north narrabeen pool i was uh, yeah. shooting from a bit further back up on the ramp that goes down for those who know narrabeen well which would be a lot of Sydney side photographers and, and Western Sydney photographers. Like they know that spot a lot, uh, pretty yep. quite well, I should say. So I was sh- sitting back at the ramp before it drops down to the pool and it was this nice storm rolling through with a cool co- um, cloud, real dark, ominous looking cloud. Yep. And I just took it in black and white. Like I'd always had this passion for black and white and, and that was the defining point for me. It's just, like, I like this better than what I like it in black and st- in color. Yeah, and that's yeah. where it really pinpointed. So that would have been probably about a year or so into me right. um, shooting. So very early in the piece. And yeah, so that's where it started for me, like this direction. I kept it in under wraps for a fair while because of the whole Instagram popularity thing. I fell for that trap and just kept yeah. on producing these color bombs and all that sort black, of stuff. Black and white doesn't get, get the likes, does it? It didn't. No, it didn't. Still doesn't it does but it doesn't at the moment but yeah, there, it, it's got a it's got a niche yep. there but it, correct it's not, yep. not as popular as the color bombs it's just correct like, yeah that's right it doesn't stand out and grab your attention so <laughs> unless you're looking at it but yeah so that i really put it to the side and did it in the background and trained myself up to where i am today with it so it's taken me all this time to really teach myself yeah right back then there was no one doing it it was real taboo very big in, in europe and england they had the awesome conditions for that sort of style. But, but here in Australia, there wasn't, everyone was so influenced by people like Ken Duncan and even people, oh, there's so many people to name. I can't even like mention, we all know who they are. Like, yeah. But yeah, it was taboo. I loved it. So I kept doing it on the side and, until I was happy and really happy to, and comfortable to push that product out. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Are you more along the lines of planning your shots and pre-visualizing or do you go spontaneously with what the conditions are and, and, yeah. and what's in front of you? It depends. If I'm going to somewhere like Cathedral Rocks where I want to go all the way across to the far side and shoot the two stacks, yep. I'll be paying attention to tides um, yeah, yeah. and what the swell's doing. And I think that goes for not just my photography, that goes for a lot of landscapers. They should really pay attention to what the swell's doing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Tides are doing because anything... Like, and sit there and watch it for a couple of minutes before you go out. We've yeah. all been whacked with a rogue wave. So if you can prolong that, then you're doing the right thing. So if I'm doing places like that where safety is a concern, I will re- I will sit down and I'll meticulously go through all the weather, what's yeah, doing. Right. But a lot of my work these days, mate, I'm doing it from a car park or I'm doing it from a beach front because it's real minimal. So I don't need to walk into these places. So um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mostly I'm looking at clouds to prepare, whether it's going to be a cloud, a cloudless day or there's going to be overcast. It, it, that'll change where I go yeah. as, as a standpoint to be where I'm going. I don't really plan it as such. It's just mostly where safety is concerned is where I'll sit down and really think about it. And how important is it to you to have projects in your photography? Do you have projects or do you yep. just shoot what comes? I do both. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly where a lot of other people stand 
I've heard you say you're into projects. You like them. And you're I, into I, them. I, I do. <laughs> I, I also yeah. love just going and shooting sometimes. Yeah, yeah. The luck I, of the draw is a good thing sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So I've got currently, I've got two projects going yep. at the same time, but I really like a project and I also like just going out and shooting. So I think they're important to photographers in a way because it stops you from being getting stale yeah, in, a, yeah. in a way with your photography and getting that creative block as as a lot of us have had in the past. So at the moment, I've got two, my two projects I've got going at the moment, one's called 141, which is yep. just square crops and right. that's just of different locations and that's in color and, and uh, color and black and white and that then that's just a project that i because i love a good square yeah exactly. I, I, I love it particularly when you've got something minimal or abstract yep yeah and, it works perfectly yep yeah but it, it, even some nice square waterfalls what were your waterfall directly in the center with some nice trees around it, it looks fantastic absolutely yeah but, but yeah so that's a little project i've got going on at the moment that's ongoing that'll never stop and then I've got this one that really is the like the project, if I could call it the project, and that's called Deep End. Right. And that that one is a little bit more technical because it's all it is is pools, square right. pools. So I've got to go find a location like a pool, which in Sydney, New South Wales, all the way through the east coast, we're not we've got abundance of them. Yeah. Forty-four or forty-five of them just in Sydney. That's right. That's on the northern beaches alone. <laughs> yeah, so that one's actually started a few years back now. Um, yeah, pre-COVID, right. that one is fun. It's, that's tricky because there's a lot of images out there of, of the pool of a like yeah. a North North Narrabeen pool. Like, how many of the photographs are there of that place? I, I posted one yesterday. <laughs> you did. I saw that. <laughs> and funny enough, I don't think there's that many images from that angle shooting back towards the coastline from that angle. There is shooting back um, directly to the headland to where the pool and where you jump into the pool and, the, and stuff like that, but not quite from that angle. So yeah. that was a little bit different. Well, so thank you. Like, which, kudos to that. <laughs> yeah, the, what it was, what got my eye was actually the yeah. sky had lit up a bit pink over in yep. that direction because mm-hmm. the sunrise was out to the left of the image. Yep. yep. The sun had popped, but the sky still had a bit of pink in it down yep. in the – in the clouds there and yeah i just like the look at it uh, of yep. it and just lined it up put a 10 stopper on and uh, uh-huh. did it. i think it was a minute seven or minute 10 or something like that yeah that's a good length it's a good length but yeah no and that's that's the also positive part about just going out and shooting what's in front of you so yeah if, if you were going there as a project you could be shooting away and go oh and then but that's where you to take the blinkers off yeah, say, and you're right. looking and you go, oh, then you can pivot and change if you're shooting for that color in the sunset. But um, yeah. I'm quite stubborn, so if there's a mad sunset going on, I won't be shooting it because I've got a, I've got this vision in my head to okay. a degree. Once I get there, I know what I want. I don't have in my collection these days. I don't have any sunrises, any sunsets. So wow. okay. that's not what I'm going for in my work. So it's, I'm just going to sit here, take a photo five minute exposure over a sunrise and just sit yeah. back and enjoy it as, a, as being their presence. Yeah. Nice. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it sounds strange for an, as, as an landscape photographer to not want to take a photo of a sunset or a sunrise, but <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think it's very laudable. It's uh, yeah. it's a different, a different approach. Yeah. yeah. What does success look like in your photography? What, what, you know, is it about a shot that makes you go, yep, that's a winner. Yes, but no. This one might be a bit of a surprise, but I think success is in photography is being able to afford to buy a camera okay. to go out and shoot. I think right. that's the success there is because there's a lot of people, especially nowadays, that can't afford to go out and buy a camera. Yeah, um, yeah. Whether even if it's a, an older camera that's a couple of hundred dollars, like a couple of hundred dollars is enough to break someone's bank these days. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, yeah, I, I really think the success is being able and privileged to go out and photograph whenever we want because we can. But in terms of success as business, yeah, it's when someone wants to buy your print and hang it up on the wall. I think it's really simple. It's if somebody else apart from someone that's outside within your outside of your circle wants to buy a print and hang it on their wall for a lifetime or for however long, I think that's success right there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the cool. epitome for me. Yeah. One, one of the keys that you mentioned is understanding your gear and mm-hmm. so forth 
how did you put in the hard yards to understand your field work and processing and where did you get that skill set that backs up the creative vision that you've got a very long process i must say very long process so I throw out the manual of a camera of when I get okay. it. The box, <laughs> You're a man. You don't need to read manuals. I can't read. No. So I'll throw out a manual and I'll just pick it up and I'll have a crack, go through the menus and see what works and what doesn't. Long story short is I'll pick up a camera. I'll take a photo. I used to write down the settings and things like shot one, shot two, shot three, what I did, and then take it back. Kind of like that old film approach, but yeah, right. Um, but digitally. So I used to do that a lot until until I got it to where I, I wanted it. And then I did long I've been doing long exposures long enough now to where you turn up to a location, you go, okay, you look around you and you go, okay, cool. It's full sun blaring at 12 o'clock. Okay, I've got a 15 stop filter on. Yeah. And and then you can quickly calculate where you're gonna put your settings, where you're gonna set your camera up. But that comes with a lot of time. It's it's all trial and error. And yeah, I yeah. think personally. I think that's the best way. It's picking your camera up, playing with it, seeing what happens. Don't put it in auto as soon as you get it. Just put it straight into manual and stuff it up. It's digital. It's not film. It's not going to cost you. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just. I think you've done the same thing. You picked up a camera and you just went at it. Is that correct? Um. Can't, yeah. I did read a, a a couple of bits of the manual because yeah. they, when I upgraded from, I think my first digital camera was 500D. Yeah, okay. uh, Canon yep. 500D and when I upgraded to the 6D there's some menu options and the wireless capability and whatever so mm. I wanted to learn how to use that yeah um, okay. yep yeah I did actually read the manual there for, okay. for some of those bits that <laughs> Trade I didn't know. <laughs> but I, I knew a lot of the, the the triangle and everything I knew that from yep. the film days mm -hmm. I had the old Minolta XG1 which I started mm -hmm. photography with or it's more serious photography with yep. back in uh, back in the 80s and using that i already knew iso really wasn't a thing it depended on the film you were using and you were stuck it was with... more more asa wasn't it was yeah the, it was a, asa yeah. slash iso and, yeah. Yeah. and he, yeah. who made the film and everything but you were mm -hmm. stuck with that for your your 12 24 or 36 yeah, yeah. you didn't adjust that but you had the other two to play with you had aperture and uh and yeah. A shutter speed then to play with and so yeah. i already knew that and i'd learned a bit of that back at school back in the in in high school originally was where i first picked up a yeah. slr camera that was the first time i'd ever held one was, yeah. uh, was in high school so yeah, yeah cool. it was interesting then transferring that to digital when digital came mm -hmm. along because before i got the dslr i had a uh, bunch of point and shoots yeah, yeah. Um, and so you didn't even think about most of those things then. It was just <laughs> wham, yeah. bang, take the yeah, shot. It's ready to go. Is but that, that brings me to another point and what you were just saying about you only had 36 frames in a, in a roll of 35 mil film. That's also a good little technique, I think, for beginner photographers is yeah, uh, to totally go right. out and only limit yourself to 35 images and then go back. And that's what I did as well, is that I ha I coming through where I work, in broadcast television i have a lot of older guys that were there that shot film and yeah, we yeah. would talk photography like till the days come home like we wouldn't even yeah. tell you what happened in the show or the footy game or something <laughs> we couldn't even tell you what happened we were just talking about footy the whole that was about photography the whole time yeah. and that's what gave me the idea was those older generation photographers and artists that would say just go out shoot digital but only take 35 frames or 36 and yeah. then see what you come back with at the end note down and that's what i did and i and that's where the trial and error came in it was just yeah take i think it's still relevant in a way to this day going back and saying as a beginner take 36 frames come back oh okay that didn't work go out the next day take another 36 see what happens yeah. i actually saw, a, saw a video adam carnash has mm -hmm. been on first man photography as he's yep. uh, yeah great show yeah he did one, I think, last week or the week before. I'm not sure. And it was literally about that. He turned yep. off his back screen so he couldn't review yes. his pictures. Yep. And he yep. limited himself to, I think, 24 shots or something. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was an interesting experience to see him yep. use his digital camera like a film mm -hmm. camera and uh, and not know what his result was going to be until he actually got back you yeah, know, yeah. to the studio. 
Have you done that yourself? Have you done that? Uh, I've done it a few times, but to be honest, one of the reasons why I went digital was so I didn't have to faff about with (laughs) crappy film stuff. I went through all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Don't have to do it again. For uh, your films to get developed and the the photos to come out. And then you go, oh, yeah. Yeah. I've done that. I know there's a meme there. And I think it was started out with sort of film plate photography where you'd take six shots and six shots would be keepers. Then you got to 35 mil film and you got, Mm -hmm. I think, 36 shots or 24 shots or whatever the meme is. And you got six keepers. And Mm -hmm. now with digital, you can take 1,500 shots and get six keepers. Yeah. Yeah. It's like back in the day, was I think Ken Duncan, I'm pretty sure it was him. And he said, back in, he said, if you come away with 10 good shots per year, you're doing very well. And it's still true to this day, right? How many photos? Are we willing to put up on our web? I've got years worth of stuff yeah. on there, but yep. even some of those, I did a, a cull recently actually and I got rid of a bunch on the website simply because I didn't think they were good enough and certainly not indicative of the quality of the stuff that I'm trying to do now. Yeah. yeah. I say trying. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, not... We're always trying, mate. Like everyone's trying. No one's perfect. Yeah. That brings me to how do you deal with those failures? That experimentation process and trial and error means that there is a, an element of error. And in having that element of error, how do you deal with the errors? There's, it sounds like you're using that to learn, which is, yep. for me, the ideal way to deal with it. Yes. I'm quite cutthroat with my work. So mm-hmm. if I get at home to, and I come home from a shoot, I won't look at any of my work until probably a week later right? because okay. I don't want any stray memory of that day coming in and, and taking away from actually looking at the image Yep. Um, because it's all for, for me, it's all about the detail, it's the line of the subject and things like that. So I might sway myself to think that it's better than what it was after the shoot. Cause you still got that adrenaline pumping through your veins. Yeah, right, you right. still got that excitement from that shoot. Cause you're like, oh yes, I nailed that from, the, and you look at the back of the screen and you get to the computer and you go, mm, no, nah, that's not good at all. So from experience, I'll wait. So I'll wait a week or two or whenever I've got time, like I won't do, hit it straight after I take that photograph. So then I'll approach it. And then if it's off by one little bit of focus or detail, it's in the straight in the bin. I'm, I'm yeah, removing right. it off the cards and then I'm writing it down saying need to go back to this location. And then yeah. I go back there and I'll write down preferred conditions of the day like that day was say full cloud okay maybe partly cloudy with a bit more shadow depth would work better for this day then i'll yeah bin that photograph and then i'll go back down again so right. that's how i learned from my failures i don't keep them because then it's just clogging up memory on your hard drive so yeah, <laughs> so, yeah straight in the bin and off shooting i go again and how have you found uh, there been any sort of regrets i know i've found a few older shots Mm -hmm. that particularly from the 500d days where you know the 500d sensor it's what 15 years old something like now so it's low light capability was nowhere near what the 6d mark ii or what the r6 or r5 and all that all of those are now yeah yeah but photoshop's come along and it's got noise recovery Yep. AI noise yep. reduction. So I've actually gone back and then the the things that I would never have edited simply because of the amount of noise in them. Have yep. you ever regretted throwing something out because you the technology's moved along and you can act, could have actually recovered it? No, I don't regret not throwing okay. any of them out, to be honest. If I do a trip somewhere, they're the ones I'll keep for that exact yep. reason because it's going to be harder to get to those locations. Again. Yeah, yeah. Like I've still got files on my computer from my Europe trip I did. Back, way back in 2013 and i'm still processing those so yeah right um as in i'm going back to them with new eyes and looking at them after all these years and coming out with new ways to edit them and to make them to the way i want them so it's not so much about the gear but yeah if it's home i don't regret if it's in in australia i do not regret throwing any of them away because i know hey really we live here we can go back there at any time yeah, and, yeah. but i also feel that if i leave them on the computer I'm going to overthink them and go, oh, I could use this. But it's then effectively what I'm doing is degrading my own work and my own space about it. And that's just the way I approach it. I know a lot of guys and girls that they'll keep all their files 
all their raw files. And I'm like, what are you doing that for? You just got to have to go play. Oh, <laughs> for those who can't see, Grant just put his hand up. <laughs> but yeah, yeah so I'm, I, I'm, yeah. I, I'm really annoyed though. 2019 yep. shots, I lost about half of my collection through a hard drive failure. So I, I had JPEGs backed up Yep. elsewhere, luckily, and I had a few of the raws backed up, but most mm -hmm. of the raws went. So yeah. There's a whole Canada trip that I don't okay. have rules for at all. Yeah. But the good thing about technology these days, you could probably bring a little bit of something back out of those JPEGs if you put them into oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, you put them into Photoshop and then bring them through camera raw and you expand them and all that sort of stuff. You, there's there's things you can do now. Like yeah, but back definitely. when we would have all started photography, there was nothing. <laughs> Even with digital, you had to get it right, otherwise you stuffed. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. Totally. But yeah. But yeah, so there's pros and cons to deleting work. Depends on your work, your your workflow. Me, my work's real minimalist, as yeah, most right. people would know. So I try to keep my backups like that too. Yeah, fair enough. So fair everything enough. everything just flows into one one big category. So you mentioned you live not too far from Wollongong and the, yep, the, the right. Yellowara Coast and whatever. You're, you're mm -hmm. at Wilton there. Is that your go-to or are there other places that you keep getting called back to the places i get getting keep getting called back to are too far away for me to go yeah fair enough which are in england and venice mate but but yeah if it's my day off and i've got a few hours before i've got to go pick up the kids from school i'm down the coast i'm shooting anywhere from stanmore tops all the way down to jerringong or Jaroa. yeah that's my spot for that's where i go because it's Wollongong's 25 minutes ish from my place give or take yep like bulleye is about 30 minutes. Kiam is just under an hour. So I'm quite privileged in a way to where I live in comparison to, to, to the coast. But with my work, I also have my camera sitting in the car. So right. if I'm working on the central coast, I've got the camera in the car. I'm going out before work. Working on in broadcast TV takes me to some pretty cool spots like across the country as well. So I'll, if I have time, I'll take the camera with me. But yeah, I'd say the Illawarra is my photographic home per yeah. se. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's influenced how you shoot? You've mentioned the minimalist take mm -hmm. that you got. Do you think the area that you fell in love with has is, is had much influence on how you shoot at all? As in fell in love with Europe and England or the Illawarra itself? Um, either. And where I am now currently with my work is influenced heavily by that first trip I went to in 2013. Yeah, I put that trip to be the pinnacle into my decision, into going into where I'm going. Yeah. It was a dream to go and shoot places like Swanage. I think you've been there recently. Oh, yeah. Last year, I think it was. A couple of years ago, yeah, I did yeah, Swanage. It's like shooting there, photographing like Dirtle Door and going down to Dover and seeing all those things. Yep. Mind you, I stuffed up 90% of all those photos but we won't go there but yeah that would that kind of was pivotal into the direction i'm on now so i'd say yes it does that that really set me on that direction and and it has made me adapt a lot to how i shoot here on the Illawarra now too so i i owe a lot to that europe holiday that europe trip but not just that but also buying a lot of the english photo magazine who gave me the inspiration to do all that and then bring that sort of that iconic look over there that the, a lot of photographers have, mostly because they have the wild weather, the fog, that all that sort of stuff, which we don't really have. We do, but we don't have that here in Australia. Yeah, so you, trying to, yeah, you, really, you got to got to pick where you go and when you go for uh, exactly. those sorts yep. of conditions. And yeah. and if you're doing it full time, that works because you have the ability to go out every day. But yeah. when you can't go out every day, you've, I, I've gone. How can I get this same look? But here in Australia, which no one, not to, I'm not trying to brag or pump my own shoes up or anything like that, but no one was really doing that back then. Like yeah, the right. Fogging out the backgrounds. Not, there was no one really doing it. There was people like Christian Fletcher doing the real fine art stuff, yeah, which, yeah. Is, which is iconic and fantastic. But the, the fogging out of the backgrounds and, and really bringing out that subject, there wasn't any, many or if any, there was any. Yeah. doing that sort of thing so there wasn't much information out there of how to do that so i had to teach myself in photoshop which was grueling but that's what we do yeah, yeah we, i'd say yeah 2013 that trip to europe england and europe was the defining moment for me 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. So would you say you've got a favorite spot? Could be worldwide. Yeah, okay. I do have a favorite spot. If you go through my, not my so much my website now because it's down at the moment, but if you go through my socials, I've only got one photo from there. That would be my favorite spot. Yep. This place holds a, a deep sentimental value to me and that's North Narrabeen. Yeah. So yeah, I'd say my favorite spot, even though it's quite popular, it's relatively overshot yeah. without sounding like a, a bit of a prick on it. But I can see why. I, yeah. I, I like it. It's one of those cool little spots. It's easy to get to. But yeah, it's that would be my favorite spot of all time, regardless of all the places I've been. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that one's a bit unexpected, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's because it, emotion's key. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what a lot of photographers strive for in their photographs is, is yeah. emotion. And I find capturing images personally at Narrabeen, uh, I can add that emotion into it. Yeah, cool, cool. Mm. What's your most memorable experience? Okay, that's a tough one. <laughs> There's a few. So memorable would be shooting the old pier at the old Swanage Pier at, in England. That was pretty, when I got there, I, I had to pinch myself a little bit, even yep. though it was bucketing down rain and all this sort of stuff. And so typical English weather, it's raining. <laughs> I still got out there and shot in the rain with an umbrella and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, yeah. Um, that was that's pretty memorable to me. But again, I think one of the biggest ones for me would have to be I captured this photograph at North Narrabeen, North Narrabeen Lake. Oh, sorry, at the at, sorry, not the lake, the pool. Yep. From up high, and I photographed that, and it was a, definitely a, a breathtaking moment because it'd been a spot that I'd been to many times over the years. Not many people had photographed from there, from this yeah. position up on the cliff. So you climb yep. up the cliff and you shoot down on it. I think I was there. Was, I think the, I was there with my family for Christmas, celebrating Christmas as I had done for my entire life yep. um, at the caravan park there. And I photographed that image there and, and come away with this, what I thought is probably the best photograph I've ever taken. Yeah, well. I love it. And, and then I entered that into a competition which is rare for me. Uh, I don't really do too many of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that got, I, I think it was either 10th or 8th in uh, the Mono Awards. Yeah, well done. Australia. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. But actually, no, I didn't enter that one. No, that one got picked up. No, sorry, I'll take that back. It didn't, and I didn't enter. I wasn't allowed to because it got picked up by Australian Photography Magazine and I got a little piece written about it. Nah. So, but that would be the highlight. I think that's the most one because it's oh. got that emotion and then it was good enough to be picked out and I... And so I got to write a little article about that, like the meaning behind that image. So yeah, cool. that that would for me would probably be that would take the cake. Yeah, nice. So back to Narrabeen. What about horror stories? I've got plenty of those. I think I've drowned four cameras. That's yep. I've gotten drowned those. I think uh, we've all everyone's gone down with a camera. Like the old days used to be, you get as close as you get to the water, the better. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, nowadays, not so much. But I think. I, I look at it as horror stories as a good way to learn as mm-hmm. well. If I had to choose one, it would be all the it would be the mistakes in terms of networking and things like tours I could have done with people because yeah, I was right. too busy out going clubbing. It would have been in my mid to, uh, early 20s, so 20, 21 sort of thing where I would, every weekend I'd be out in the club instead of being out photographing and doing tours with overseas with people. So I was spending my money in the wrong place, but that's yeah, right. in hindsight. So that's what I'd say would my be my horror story was opportunities missed, but hey, we all learn from it. That's another strange one where it's not quite what most people would hear, but I'd say for me, that's my horror stories, okay. opportunities missed. Well, what uh, have you learned about the world through photography? That it's a big place and that everyone has their own opinion about the landscape as such. But I think conservation, you don't really see that through my work as such. A lot of people won't take that aside, but I am very cautious yeah. of where I stand, where yeah. I put my feet, where I put my tripod, all that sort of stuff. If there's a plant there, I, it might even be a plant that will grow back tomorrow or the next day or and so on. But I think that's the key. I know a few people have said this on your podcast in the past that it is conservation and i honestly think that we do need to really watch what we are doing out there and totally right yeah. even though we as photographers and artists are very cautious of where we stand leave no trace all that sort of thing posting to instagram and socials can 
influence these people, just your regular tourists, any regular person just to go out to these locations and not, and they won't necessarily think about it. So you've got to be yeah. very careful. And that's where, that's what I think is that we've got to be very careful in how we approach landscape and geotagging is another one. So I don't yeah, think we should no. really, if it's a very volatile area, so especially in Tasmania after the fires mm-hmm. and things like that, even before the fires, I think those guys that shoot down there a lot are very good at keeping that exact location quite quiet just say yeah, the general right. area but you've got to go find it but uh, yeah i think that's what it, i think that's what it's taught me the most is how to conserve the the land that we're walking on because really see there's a lot of plants and stuff like that, that can just die from yeah. over over traction and plus a lot of places are dangerous yeah totally take sea cliff bridge for instance we used to go there was only a handful of us that knew how to get up there like in the early days and then a few people found it and then told everyone how to get up there as in non-photographers yeah and I remember going up there once and I was wearing full hiking boots and I was slipping all over the place. And yep. there were people, people up there in thongs. Yeah, and, yeah. Sitting, and that was the last straw for me. I'm like, I'm never going up there again. It's too yeah. dangerous. I don't want to show people I'm going up there. I took all the photos down from up there. Yep. Yeah. So I think it's safety. I think it's conservation and safety. So if we yeah. go up there, people are going to go up there. So yeah. I they're, think they're, the last time I was there, there was about 20 or 30 people up there. Yeah, it's a summer. nightmare. It is. It's just there's so many people up there. It's just they've worn the grass away, and it's literally just dirt there now. Yeah. So if there's a bit of moisture, you can go over the edge quite yeah, easily. Absolutely. <laughs> it's very dangerous. And, yeah. and yeah, so that that's what I think. That's what I've learned is safety and conservation. I think is are the keys that we need to be looking at as photographers. Yeah, it's great advice. Great advice. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the podcast. So yeah. yep. you and Carl Strand. That's right. Uh, Yep. What do you call it? The it's the gallery podcast. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. So, how did you get guys get started, and what what's it all about for people that haven't listened? Yeah, for uh, so it started. Well, the conversation started probably about five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. Carl and I, a little backstory. Carl and I have known each other for close to 11, 12 years or something like that now. Yeah. So we've been we met photographing. I can hear we. He worked with a mate of mine that I grew up with through school and they were out photographing and I met up with him after a shoot. So I met him yeah, about 12 years ago or so, give or take. And yeah, so the conversation started about yeah five years ago, I think pre-COVID, but then we put it on the back burner because of like how busy we are and things like that. Like he had a full-time job. I was either working every weekend and then like moving like where I live away from him at the time. I think he lived in Sydney somewhere. So it was about an hour drive, which is no distance. It's not too dissimilar now to, to where he is now. But yeah, right. But yeah, so then we put that on the back burner. And then I think one day a year ago, so probably late January, early Feb last year, we're out shooting at, it was, it'll come back to me. But yeah, we're out shooting somewhere on the Illawarra and, and we were just talking about it. And we, I think I actually mentioned your show. Um, okay. to him because i was talking about one of the episodes and it was like how good it was like just hearing the input from one of the landscape photographers i think it might have been william patino actually okay uh, that yeah. i first that i think i might have heard i think but uh yeah so anyway we're, because we both knew william patino from shooting on the illawarra a, a lot back yeah. in the day and and through one of the groups that we used to shoot with and then we were talking about that and then we then it just came up to say, why don't we address that that conversation we had five years ago and, and start our own? We're like, we know we're in different circles. We knew a few different photographers away from the ones that you had already recorded. So yeah, right. we were a bit stressed and a bit concerned that we we're going to be overlapping a lot. Yeah, yeah. But but then we're like, we're all got our own approach, so it doesn't matter as long as we work together. And no, this is that, it. The more, yeah, exactly the more right. the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it inspires as long as it inspires other people. That's right. But then we're just like, you know what? Let's give it a crack. It wasn't so expensive to do, so we that shoot we already had, and I go aboard a gate when things like that come up. So yeah, right. We, he just start. We just started talking about it, and next thing we're like, oh what's the name and we came up with all these ridiculous names <laughs> <laughs> it's just like no nah, let's not do that let's not that i said what about like what is it that every photographer wants in their career and as a photographer and everyone's like yeah. an exhibition a gallery space i said why yeah. do we call it the gallery the gallery podcast because we're all viewing so it's like you're, you're exhibiting somebody else's work but just through a podcast and they're like then it's stuck 
Yeah. And as soon as that was decided, bang, Instagram page was up, <laughs> ready to go. And yeah, so that yeah, that's how it came about. It was just a, one of those things that we'd been talking about for quite some time. And it was, and it was like, you know what? Now's the time. Let's have a crack and see what happens. And then, yeah. so now we're here. People that haven't listened, what's your focus? Are you, mm-hmm. are you selling all my questions and, and asking them or you got your own? No, nah, we're not. We're using yours every day. No, nah. that's fine. <laughs> no, nah, nah, I have listened don't. to it, so I know. <laughs> Who are you? No, no, no. So we um, we do listen to your podcast, and so we do try to pivot away from that and then draw from questions that may have not come up. And but we we don't structure anything. We don't ask. We don't put any questions down on paper. Yeah, we right. don't have a structure for a show. It's just a general conversation. So we just go, we call them up, and then we draw a question from their answer, from their original conversation piece. Like we'll bring them in by getting them to introduce themselves. And if we know their work, we'll then go, oh, what about this? Talk about that. And then what's your, and then we, every answer, we draw a question from that. So it, it's not one question is the same to a degree. And that's how we structure our show. It works for the minute. We've had a, quite good feedback from our host so uh, sorry our guests so far saying it was just felt like a, a conversation piece and, and that's yeah. quite what we want everyone's in the room i'm sure you're the same like you like to have it's everyone's welcome even though it's like a one-on-one conversation yeah. sort of things and that's how we like to structure it it's just hey let's keep it easy going see where it goes if we talk about photography we talk about photography if you want to go on another tangent so be it we'll go with it so yeah, cool, cool. yeah it's just go with the flow our motto on yeah. that situation, on that podcast. I know you've had a few non-photographers on yep. the show. Yep. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so really good. Yeah. That was the original plan was to have art as general, to break down those walls of between, oh, photography is not an art. Oh, artists are just this, like the, the yeah, infighting yeah. that happens and the <laughs> politics is just ridiculous. But what we found, we were doing a disservice to not just the artists, but to ourselves because we know a little bit about art because we did it. We started off doing a bit of that before, way before photography. And, but then what we found is that we just didn't have anything in common with a lot of the, the one of those artists. It's got nothing yeah, to do. Right. It's no offense to the artists. Like they're fantastic. The artwork that those people were producing was, is great. And, yeah. and I'm probably going to buy some and put it up on my wall. Nice. It's just we, per, on a personal level, we just didn't connect. We struggled and we were mentally drained because we were trying to think about what was coming out and what questions we were going to ask, and, and which is not a bad thing, but it just uh, we kind of felt the flow just wasn't there. Yeah. And we're like, we can move to back to photography, which we know about, but we won't restrict on what sort of photographers we get on. And that's why we started with the artists and the photographers and now that's why you'll see now that we're down with the mostly the photographers now yeah cool cool it's all a learning curve and 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 as you would know it's you learn as you go to what works and what doesn't and at this point in our journey the art the artists just weren't working for us because we couldn't feel we didn't feel like we could really showcase them as a as an artist uh, because we don't we're not in that field so we just yeah we just didn't feel like we were doing them as any service. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. I guess one of the things both photographers, artists and mm-hmm. podcasters come up against are creative blocks. Yep. How do you deal with them and what do you do when you're not feeling photography or you're not feeling the podcast or whatever? What What do you do to get around it? We just don't do it. We go do okay. something else. <laughs> No, I know that's a bit bit rough, but no. Sometimes the best answer. Yeah. I, luckily for me that if I'm not feeling it, I, I, I've i got my kids, so they take my mind off a lot of things. And surprisingly, they're so creative as well. So if I can just, I, they love drawing. My yeah. oldest son doesn't mind taking photos either. On He's got a little camera. So sometimes just hanging out with people is, can give you that creative kick that you need. There's no right or wrong answer with it, really. It's... It comes down to what happens on the day. So I'm actually going through a, a little block at the moment, to be honest. Okay. It's, so I haven't taken a, like last year was a terrible year for photography for me. I think yeah. I only went out probably no more than 15 times, like wow. a handful yeah. of times. There was not many times that I went out because of time and, and stuff like that and, and other ventures and things like that. But that killed me. So in mm. a way, and, and I'm struggling to get back into that motion now. 
but it's slowly coming back. But yeah, it's all a it's all a, a journey. So find that thing that you can. For me, I go out with my hang out with my kids and go to the beach. So I'm not annoyed about not going out and shooting because I'm, I'm keeping busy. So I'm always yeah. busy. So I know it'll come back. Sometimes time away is good. Yeah, yeah. Like I had two years away without a camera. Probably about four or five years ago, I went down with a camera and. I had my first son and couldn't afford to buy a camera. So I was away from it for two years. And, and that's the best thing uh, yeah. that ever happened to is to not have anything for two years. Been taking time, you come back with fresh eyes. So I honestly think if you've got a block or a block, creative block or whether it be financial block or anything, I, I think the best thing you can do is write it out. Let it happen. Yeah. Em, embrace that time away from it. You'll come back and you'll fire, be firing on all, four, all cylinders. Yeah, let the passion build up. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And then you truly know whether or not you want to do something or what, yeah. where you want to go. So instead of just going with emotions, you've had time to think where, which direction you want to go and, yeah. and you go hell for leather with it. So I think you, my tip would be embrace the time, embrace, yeah. embrace that freedom and, and that time away from it. What do you see as the future of photography and the biggest challenge facing it right now? I've thought about this one and there is something that's a little bit controversial in, in my answer. And it, uh, it's not to be, I don't want it to be taken as a negative because it's yeah. actually quite a positive. But I think one of the biggest challenges for photographers, and a lot of people might think it's going to be AI or financial, that they are challenges, but I think they can also be spun into positives as well. Yep. Everything can be spun in a positive. But my biggest challenge in that I think I see facing photographers is photographers. Okay. And the, the reason being is because we're all trying to make it, right? So we all want to sell photographs. We've all been guilty of it. We've done it. Like I've done it. I know a lot of people have done it. So we're all guilty of doing it at some point. But I think photographers, that they're trying to make it as a photographer full time. And I just don't think this day and age, it, it can, it's viable because there's so many out there doing a lot of photography. Mm. So what, that, what I've noticed that people are doing is they're dropping the value of their, pro, their, their product. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're bringing down the prices just to make a sale. And what I think we need to do as a community, and I use this, I, I strongly believe we should be a community, not a competition. And that would be, we need to have this little thing is that don't bring your prices down because what, pe what the outside person looking in are going to go, why can I buy that photograph cheaper over here? And, but you're charging. So what's going to happen is that then the public, if we degrade our own work, the public are going to devalue it as well. Yep. So I think we need to, as a community, we need to bump up. We need to respect everybody's work, no matter who they are, what affiliation they are, what group they belong to, or what photographers they want to emulate or be like. I think we all need to be one as a community, value out each other's work, prop each other up. So then the outside looking in, see a, a cohesive art form, and then the value of our work will go up and then we don't have to screening for these cheap prices just to make a sale yeah and i think that i know it sounds really bad it's not negative i think it's just it's actually just a way we've got to spin the way we sell it and the sale tactics that we've got to do band together so we can become stronger together instead yeah. of fighting each other individually because it's not going to work and then that's where ai comes in and play and and that's where they take your sale yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, mean I think yeah it's it's a tough one. It sounds like a, I'm being a bit of a prick, but I've been guilty. I've done it. I've lowered prices before. And then I've just gone, no, I'm devaluing myself as, a, as an artist. I think the, the biggest problem, and it stems from what you were just saying, mm. is that there's a glut of photography out there in the market. Yep. In yep. In terms of sales. And the demand is limited, particularly given that there is so much free stuff online and if people you know are looking for whether it's a, a background for their phone or a screensaver or mm -hmm. whatever it is yep. there's a lot of stuff out there that they don't have to pay for and yep. therefore the value of photography has dropped simply because of the the volume yeah. that's out there no, and the lack of no. demand. yeah i i totally agree i'm, I'm um, not suggesting people should drop their prices no, but I, I totally agree with you. There are a lot of free things out there, but at the end of the day, they're not the clients that you want. No, that's right. Don't, like don't exactly don't lower your prices for somebody that wants something for free. It doesn't like businesses. You don't see businesses doing that. That's right. Uh, 
you don't see tradies doing dropping their prices because somebody wants it for a thousand dollars less. No way. So I, in my opinion, I don't think we should be doing that either because you're giving your hard earned knowledge and work away for nothing. Yeah. And it's, we've all done it. Like I said, it's just the one, there's, there are, there are a few people that can, like a few photographers out there that are keep doing it and they think because it, it works for them and they're yeah. making a sale, they see a sale as a sale, but really realistically, they're not coming away with anything. They're, they're actually still losing yeah. you know, the time and the money and the gear and the knowledge. It's not worth it. So yeah, don't, I think that's the biggest challenge for me would be because it's such a hard line out there. I think people need to really stand together and hold firm on their prices and not lower them and degrade their work. So yeah. that, that, that's what I think. That It's harsh, but it is. It's true. <laughs> yeah, no, totally agree. Totally yeah, agree. Yeah. What tips have you got for someone just starting out in landscape photography? Uh, landscape photography? I'd say just get out there, have a crack, put your camera on manual, throw the manual away or no. So I won't suggest throwing the manual away because it can come in handy. I think the biggest thing you can do, I think there's so much information out there on YouTube now, podcasts, we all talk about our little the gear that we use. We talk about little techniques and things like that. I think there's so much information out there. Yeah. Jump on YouTube. If there's something you don't know, first give it a crack. And if you can't figure it out in the camera, then resort to YouTube because then or something like that. But I, my, my first thing would be pick the camera up, turn it on, have a go. And yeah. if there's something you can't work out, then move forward into onto YouTube. But that's just technical. But in terms of shooting itself and composition, I think, again, have a crack, set your camera up in a position. You go, okay, that doesn't work for me. Okay, let's move it over a half an inch or let's go on another angle. Let's go. If there's a jetty, shoot it front on. Okay, you don't like that. That's fine. Okay, maybe I'll shoot it over here or shoot it. Like, just have a go. Keep trial and error. It's cheap. To, to take a photograph, you can just burn it and throw it away. It's not like it's film. So take as many photos as you can and learn from every single one of them. Yeah. Cool. What's the best piece of advice or worst piece of advice anyone's given you? Best? I, I could probably get both. The best bit of advice I've ever gotten was from Glenn McKimmon. Mm. And his advice was roughly about 13 years ago when I first, I've been shooting for about 16 years now. And yep. um, and it was that period where I was on an hour and about black and white photography. I re- he knew I had that passion for it. And, and he said, keep at it. He goes, don't care about what anyone else thinks, just do it. And he yep. goes, and that's what he said. He just said, hang tight, stick to your guns. You're doing great. He goes, no one's doing what you're doing at the moment. And he goes, and you've got a bit to go, but you're on the right track. And he said, yeah. just hold strong. And that was the best bit. I, I know that was the best bit of advice I ever got. Whether he remembers saying that or not, I don't know, but I most certainly do. And the worst, a bit yeah. of advice, I won't say who said it <laughs> because that's, that's, that's not fair, but that person was trying to change the way I composed my Milnes work way back when. So when I was like still trying to learn it and he, he was trying to coach me on how to, to do things and I'm like, that doesn't work. He wanted yeah. me to frame up the way he framed up and I'm like, well, you're a traditional landscape photographer. It doesn't work for me Yeah, in, in my instance. But yeah, so that's the worst bit. It was one was telling me to stick to the guns, which I think everyone should be, which should do, yeah. I should, should say. Stick to your guns, stay true to yourself, and then don't listen to the people that keep on telling you no, don't do it. <laughs> do it this way, do it that way. Just do what you want to do. You're at the you're at the end of the day, you're the artist. Yeah, you're in it's control. Your and exactly. I, you, you nailed it. Yeah. I actually agree with what you said earlier that the best thing you can do is do what you enjoy doing mm, yep. until you don't enjoy it. And if you yep. don't enjoy it, stop doing it. So if you're enjoying doing a particular style or a yep. particular type of photography, well, keep doing it until yep. you stop enjoying it. Yeah, exactly. And if you love very vibrant, oversaturated imagery, then keep Go making for it. it. Exactly. Go for it. I not mean, everyone will it. like it. Not everyone exactly. will hate it. Sometimes Something. having, sometimes we need more niche. I, I honestly feel that I think that's another thing that can degrade photography as well. If everyone's shooting the same thing yeah, and there's the no creativity, way. of course, people are just going to go for the cheapest because why would I go? There's a, a shot of Cathedral Rocks. Why would I go and spend $5,000 on a shot of Cathedral Rocks when there's an exactly, an exactly the same photograph for $200? Yeah. It's a no-brainer. It's a no 
I think there's got to be that creative. There's got to be that creative um, line think, as well. So yeah. I mean, be yourself as an artist, and if you like it, do it. If you don't like it, don't do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> what would you be if you weren't a photographer? Probably doing, unfortunately, doing what I'm doing now. Okay. <laughs> and that's working in broadcast television. Nah. Yeah. It's a good. It's a good job. I get to travel the country and, and work on sport, so I can't complain. But at this point, it's a. It's not. It's nonsense to think that I wouldn't be shooting. Let's put it that way. I'll probably still be shooting. I just wouldn't be doing anything with them. But in the grand scheme of things, I'd probably just be doing what I'm doing and being a dad like I'm doing now. So everything would be the same except for the fact that I'm not shooting if that was an option. (laughs) But there's no option. option. It's never happening. (laughs) Even if I don't shoot for three years, I'm still looking at photography, looking at gear. I'm not doing any of that. doesn't matter. Like It's always going to be there, but at what capacity, I'm not sure, but. I'm sure there's going to be a time where I'll probably have another two years off. So, yeah, fair enough. But yeah, there's, I'm going to say there's no option for it. It's not happening. Are there any photographers out there that I should be talking to? Oh, there's a million that you could be talking I to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've got a couple of lists that I know you're focused predominantly on landscape photographers, but I do have an, an Illawarra photographer who she does a lot of work for, it's like, female body positivity and she okay. shoots it's in the shakes it's all underwater sort of stuff with the female body and things like that they are it is quite controversial because they're not wearing anything okay but, it's, but you don't see anything either so yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. Is a plus but yeah her message is great and i think for your listeners i think as well it would be a fantastic listen and her name is emma kate mags we've okay. had her on we've had her on our podcast and she is she's amazing she's a talent She's lovely. She and her work is unbelievably and uh, unbelievable, and it's different. But the yeah. message behind it is awesome. But she does do them like on the beach, so there is a landscape aspect to it. But the message is what's key. So I'd have it if you could get her on. I reckon you, your listeners might get a little something out of that. Okay. It's all about female positivity and body as well, and and yep. the emotion and all that sort of stuff. She's got a great story. I think that she, someone like her would be good to get on. Another one, I believe you're talking to Carl Strand at the moment. You got him on the cards. He's another like landscape, traditional landscape. His technical knowledge of printing and camera setup and stuff is, is unbelievable. Yeah. So you could probably get a lot out of that with him, with technical knowledge, composition, hiking, all that sort of stuff. You'd have a great time yeah. talking to him. Just, just trying um, to set up a date with him. Yeah, no, I was talking to him yesterday. So, yeah, I said, you need to get on, mate. <laughs> um Aerial, in terms of aerial, I think Tim Wright would be my go-to. He's a good bloke. Great. He, yeah. he His knowledge of airplanes, he flew his history with his, I think it was his granddad used to fly mm-hmm. uh, planes as well. Great photographer. His work, not just on the phone, but on in print, it looks unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. There's some great photographers out there, but for me, Tim is fantastic. I yep. think a lot of people need to get across Tim's work. Um, yeah, in, in, I think he he has the potential to be one of the best aerial photographers in the country, and I don't use that lightly. And in terms of black and white photographers, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I'm not sure if you've had him yet. But Alan Copy, I've probably said his last name wrong, but no, I haven't yet. Yeah, but his work is fantastic. I've met him. I've seen it in print. His black and white work is unbelievable. I, like in person, and plus his new fine art sort of style. Well, he's pretty sick too it's pretty cool so i think alan copy and then one last one who's a hunter valley based photographer in the same sim very similar style to my black and white but i think it's steve algie he's his work is um, yeah yeah, his stuff is fantastic there's a couple of shots where we are very close in terms of like the locations exact the compositions exact but the the little pro little bit of processing but we're very close so no he's very good as well his work is fantastic so There'd be some that I'd, I'd have a chat to, but I could have a list of a thousand, yeah. as you'd know. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you very much for those. No worries. Anytime. I've got one more question for you, and it's uh, the most important one I can ask. Let's go. Do you like pineapple on pizza? Yes, all day. They're easy. <laughs> no, what, oh, I've got one for you. What about on a hamburger? <laughs> no, absolutely. Pineapple yeah. and uh, beetroot and, yep. and, and cheese and Give egg. it to it. Lettuce, everything. And Give lettuce it all. and tomato. Yep. But would you have beef or chicken with it? <laughs> oh, beef only and oh, yep. barbecue yep. sauce only. You can keep that. Uh, 
that, that red special. stuff. Yeah, uh, get that. Get rid of that, mate. No, we don't uh, need it. And tomato <laughs> sauce just doesn't work on a burger. But yes, pineapple, one hundred percent on a pizza. But if I can, I'll have it on everything except for pepperoni, maybe. Pepperoni's by itself, mate. No, you don't put anything else with that. All right. It's been wonderful having a chat to you, Dean. Where can people find your work? And your um, at, at the moment, you can find my work at uh, dmaguire.com. I'm oh, sorry, dmaguire.au on both Facebook and on Instagram. I'm mostly on Instagram at the moment. My website is down. Hopefully by the time this website, so the episode comes out, it'll be up and yep. working. I've just got a new price list from a new printer. So I'm, I'm currently working through that. So that's why it's down at the moment. The podcast, you can find it wherever you listen to your podcast and it's just the gallery pod. You'll find that on all services. Hopefully you get as much out of that as what you do from this one. Grant Grant's is an awesome podcast. And, and honestly, mate, I really do thank you for having me on. This is the first podcast I've been on as a guest. So I do thank you for that. You popped my cherry. I think running my own's made it a little bit easier to talk to you. But <laughs> if you yeah, had done this two, if you had done this two years ago, mate, I don't think I would have been this upfront. It, so, it does take a little bit of uh, time to well, get yeah. used to chatting yeah. to somebody. About- yeah, I'm not used to it. I'm still not used to it. So you don't really hear me talking too much about myself. But yeah, again, thank you. Thanks for having me, man. It was it's been great. No, it's an absolute pleasure, mate. And thank you for uh, being on the show. No worries. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm-hmm.